Well, good morning. It's nice to be back. Um, we are in Proverbs chapter 20. Uh, the notes on the bulletin say uh, verses 3 through 7. But as I begin to meditate upon this, uh, chapter 20 and verse 6 takes about 35 minutes. So, uh, in constraints of time, I thought what I would do is separate them out. So, I'm going to take Proverbs uh, 20, verse 6, alone, uh, stand alone. I was asked really not too long ago to preach, and I picked this text. I'm not asked to preach very much, and I don't blame them. Um, 20 verse 6 is, seems to be a very simple, straightforward proverb. Uh, as for many people, each person proclaims his its unfailing kindness. It is... Of course, the Hebrew word hesed. But, now this is an interesting word. Translated faithful, translated trustworthy, uh, translated conscientious, person who can find. So, that is our proverb. And here is the way we're going to teach it. We are looking for performance perfect. Now, you don't know what that term means. That's my job. And by the time we leave, if I've done my job, you will understand performance perfect. Now, in order to study this proverb thoroughly, I want you to set a tab at... 2 Samuel 24, because that's where we're going to spend the vast majority of our time. 2 Samuel 24. Now, as we approach this proverb, I want you to think about Solomon for a moment, the king of Israel, the son of David. You know, a king has a unique vantage point. Unique in the throne room. He looks instantly at all the faces. Whereas the subjects look only at his face. And not their own. So he sees all kinds of people in all kinds of situations and circumstances. And the people line up in rows to talk or to speak or to plead with the king. I think that's what makes this particular proverb 20 verse 6 so intriguing. Talk is cheap in the world. People claim to be loyal to you, and they certainly would to the king, and particularly into his throne room. Everyone comes in ingratiating themselves to the king. But he has an interesting insight into that. He tells us that everybody proclaims covenant loyalty. But he is really looking in his kingdom for a different type of person. That's our subject today. Look, notice the top line as we begin the uh, proverb. As for many people. The phrase emphasizes the majority of the people. That would be the people that come in to see the king, that line up, 
that appear before Him as He sits upon His throne. Look at this word proclaims. It's an interesting word. We've had it before in the study of Proverbs. Proverbs 1.21, it's the word to shout. It was used for wisdom, shouting at the people, at the gates of the city at the beginning of the book as they passed in and out of the city. This word Wisdom proclaimed, shouted out to the people, listen to me. I have something valuable for you. But very few really stopped and listened. They were busy people with busy agendas. But that's this word. And then, of course, there is the familiar word hesed. H-E-S-S-E-D. Unfailing kindness, covenant loyalty. It is God's faithfulness to Israel, keeping His promises. But so deep and rich is that word that in the English language we can't define it. It's the proverbial hole in the dam. The moment you get... Your finger in one spot, suddenly water springs in another. And here we are, all contorted, thinking that we have figured this word out. It is the perfect cut of diamond when hit with a laser. And the wall lights up. That's this word. Oh, it's green. No, it's blue. No, it's this. It's that. The word tells us it is certainly from above because it is undefinable by language. And then we're looking, says the king, for the conscientious, the faithful, the trustworthy individual. It's much more than the idea of reliability. You see, that's what any good service company provides. You're in good hands with Allstate. No, this is, this is much different than that. This is a sensitive person who is practicing service to you because of their devotion, love for the Lord, dedication to to him, and you just happen to be in the way. So you get all of the goodness that this person produces because of their love for him. Now, what I'd like to do for the balance of our time is I would like to do a case study. It's very easy to define words. Here is the definition of this word, that word. But let's really do a case study. That's what you do at business school. Case study. How one company handled this matter. You do it in law school. How did you handle this case as opposed to that case? We do that with the decisions of the court. This is what the court said about that. So I want to put this in that kind of a context. I don't want to just define the word. I want to show you the word so that we will all come away with an exact idea, because we've seen it, trustworthy, conscientious. 2 Samuel 24, that's our text for the balance of the time. It will complete our proverb this morning. Now I will run through the narrative and then As we get close, I will slow down. But the narrative is important in order for you to 
truly see what we're talking about here. So in verses 1 through 9, David has numbered the fighting men of Israel. And after doing so, he is pricked of conscience. So much so, verse 12, that God sends the prophet Gad to the king to chastise him for what he's done. He offers him three doors. Door number one, door number two, door number three. Now, those are three doors on a game show you don't want. Matter of fact, you don't even want to be in the game show for this. These are horrible providences behind any one of these three doors for the king. And so the king tells the prophet, verse 14, the more modern translations read, great or deep distress. The King James actually calls it a strait. Here's the word. It's actually hard. And we all identify with that because we say to one another, you're in a hard place. That's the word. That's the idea. David chose the plague. And he gives us the reason for doing so. And it has nothing to do with people. It has everything to do with the Lord and His relationship to Him. And so, he chose the plague in hopes that God would be merciful as He always is merciful. Verse 15, here is the sunrise upon Israel that horrible morning. From Dan, the father's tribe to the north, to Beersheba, which is the largest city, to the tribe of Simeon in the far south. 70,000 fighting men of Israel drop dead. Back 50 years ago, the late Michael Creighton released a book entitled The Andromeda Strain. It became a blockbuster movie. It was about a team of scientists called to investigate a small, out-of-the-way, southwest town. What was interesting and phenomenal about the town is that everyone dropped dead in their places. They called it a fire. We have a fire. An outbreak of something. And everyone died in the place. That's this idea. Now, verse 16 is really very fascinating because we're informed that the agent, the agent of this catastrophe is actually an angel called, notice your text, the angel of the Lord. In a parallel passage, 1 Chronicles 21.16, David lifted up his eyes. He saw this angel suspended with a sword in his hand over Jerusalem. We think immediately of the Passover, don't we? Exodus chapter 12. But the inspired language, the actual text itself as it was written, doesn't mention the word angel. It uses the word destroyer. It uses the word spoiler. Now make no mistake, it were 
the angels involved. We know that. Psalm 78, verse 49, it mentions a band of destroying angels attacking Egypt and the land and the people therein. In 2 Kings 19, again this term, this title, the angel of the Lord put to death overnight 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Dead on the spot. It was a great victory for Israel. Saved Jerusalem. In Numbers 22, one identified as the angel of the Lord gives a warning to Balaam. And finally, even in the New Testament itself, in the book of Acts, we have this same title, the angel of the Lord who smote King Herod. And in smiting him, the text of Scripture says at that moment, he was eaten by worms. So here specifically, in our text, it is revealed that this angel of the Lord was at this threshing floor, this threshing place where they separated wheat from chaff. And it was owned by one Aruna, the Jebusite. There's much scholarly discussion about this name Aruna. Page after page of speculation regarding his name. And after reading it, I'll tell you, nothing is really very clear at all. But here is what is clear. Jebusite. You see, the Jebusite were the occupiers of the ancient city of Salem, which became David's city named Jerusalem. The Jebusites as a people, were among the Canaanites listed in the table of nations. Genesis chapter 10. So essentially, Amorites are people that should have been killed when Joshua came up and took the land. Well, it just so happens that Joab took the city in the name of David. And for that, he earned his stripes. General Joshua. Uh, General Joab is given that title over the armies of David for his capture of this ancient city. Now verse 17, David a man after God's own heart, now quickly and without hesitation confesses his sin. That's what made David a great man. Flawed, as we all are, certainly. But David was tender to the Lord at all times in his life. And that's what made him great. I think we have been studying the Proverbs together long enough to know this term sheep in verse 17. 70,000 fighting men in Israel dead. And the proverb chapter 14 and verse 28, in the multitude of people, is the glory of a king. David has been stripped of his glory. That's what sin does. That's what sin does to you. That's what it does to me. 
It ruins you. It ruins your name. It ruins your reputation. It ruins the way people look at you, think about you, and remember you. Verse 18, now implied the Lord sends Gad back to David. Now these words go up. Those words go up are so essential to this story and to this narrative. Go up is key here. Go up and erect an altar to the Lord at the threshing floor of Aruna the Jebusite. You see, David was right to choose God's mercy because God is merciful and He can be counted on that way all through our lives. Verse 19, and notice again, very small words, so important, went up. Now here's why that is important. Going up, David is leaving the ancient city, the confines of the city of David, Jerusalem. Samuel uses this term to go up in the book of Samuel to tell us something very important. That to go up, you leave one domain and go to another. Here it is, 2 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 1. David inquired of the Lord after the death of King Saul. Shall I go up? There it is. And the Lord said, yes, go to Hebron in Judah and stay there. So, he is leaving here in our text what you and I would call the city of the city limits of Jerusalem. And he is going to the home or property that the Lord God has specifically chosen. Now that's important. And here's why. Because we're going to find out that this is much more than meets the eye in going up. Verse 20, so look how this all begins to fit together like pieces of a puzzle. David and his entourage going up. And Aruna, for his part, looking down. You see that? Threshing floors were high places where the wind could be effective in separating the wheat from the chaff. Now, with all this narrative background given to you, now our proverb, Proverbs 20, verse 6, comes into view. You see, we're looking for a person, says King Solomon, who is called faithful, who is conscientious, who is called trustworthy. He's a person who is sensitive and desires to do what he does for the Lord and for the Lord's sake. And here's the person. Aruna. We know that. Look, he prostrates himself, his face to the ground. Hardly an arrogant Jebusite that taunted David and his men. 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 6. No, this is a different man. 
This is a different spirit. Verse 21, he asks, why has the Lord, the King, come to His servant? And the answer from David to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord. That the plague would be literally restrained. The word means to diminish. Psalm 107, verse 39, the Lord chastened the children of Israel and their cattle. This word, diminished, were restrained in the field. They became fewer in number. That's the idea of the word. In verse 22, Aruna says to David, let the Lord, my Lord the King, take and offer what is good in His sight. Look, he says, the oxen for the burnt offering, the threshing sledges for the yoke, and all the wood that is needed for the altar. Aruna had it all packaged together in one fell swoop. Now, verse 23. Everything, O King, Aruna gives. Look at that word, to give. Don't look at me. Look at your text. A recent Hebrew grammar called that verb to give performance perfect. You see, when we study the Bible, what we want to do is we're like safe crackers. We put our ear up to the the safe, and we dial it in so carefully. And that's what we're doing by classifying words or often verbs. We're trying to dial in the precise idea of the word. More than the word itself. Rather to give you a full panoramic picture, the idea of the word and what's behind the word delivered to you so that you can clearly understand what's going on in the use of the Word. The Hebrew grammar calls this to give a performance perfect. In other words, He gives to David far beyond what David ever expected in that moment. A performance perfect. He came for a real estate transaction. A real estate transaction for the ages. But what he found is he got much more. Aruna offered him everything at his disposal and for his use. Verse 24, And David says to Aruna, No, I will buy them from you for a price. And then look at this. Look at your text. David, in performance perfect, says, I will not give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. Offered to Him freely. But David, for... And to the Lord his God, his response, he goes above and beyond. Now, of course, we know historically the significance of this purchase. Remember? Going up outside the city limits of the ancient city of David. 
He goes up outside the city limits to a different place, a different domain, owned by a Jebusite, up on a hill where a threshing floor was located. And David purchases it. And at his death, he gives it to Solomon. And it is there, owned by David, that the temple is built. A real estate transaction for the ages. In Genesis chapter 23, we have the story of Abram in verses 3 through 16. He has an encounter with the Hittites for the purchase of a cave called the Cave of Machpelah. It involved the cave and the adjoining field. Genesis 23, 5. The Hittites say to the man with the promises, the faithful man of the land, you, sir, are a mighty prince among us. Bury your dead in the choicest of our tombs. But Abram, there, in verse 8, insisted that Ephron, son of Zoar, sell him the cave and the adjoining land at the full price. And then Ephron, sitting among the people, his people, the Hittites, at the gate of the city, says, no, I give you the field and the cave in the presence of my people. Now folks, in the ancient Near East, that's all right title and interest to the transaction. That's including the little stamps at the bottom. It's all done. All done. Among His people, the great Ephron at the city gate. But Abram insisted and paid the full price, 400 shekels of silver. The only real estate transaction that this man, the faithful man, ever owned in the land that he was promised. You see, Abram in performance perfect went above and beyond. And aren't we glad he did? So believing the promises of God and setting for us a lasting testimony. This is the way that the faithful man, this is the way the conscientious man, this is the way the trustworthy person conducts his affairs among men in the world. It's Job who offered sacrifices and burnt offerings for his children in case, here's his testimony, in case they, in the quietness of their heart, might have sinned against the Lord far above his own personal righteousness. No, he offers for them. It's the characteristic of what Jesus tells us are people of his kingdom. Here's the way he puts it. If someone asks you for their coat, give them your tunic as well. If a Roman soldier asks, you to carry his gear for a mile, carry it too. There it is. It's Elizabeth Elliot, whose husband was speared in the river. And she has a little girl that comes up to her kneecaps out in that benighted land. And she stays on the mission. And in the providence of God, several weeks later, someone led her in 
to the Alka Indian camp. She teaches them the Word of God, even leading the very men that speared her husband to the Lord. It's Dan Duncan. When the lights are out and this building's closed, he comes into this auditorium. He sits in these pews and he prays for the people of Believer's Chapel. I want you to observe the proverb ends with a question. Who can find that kind of person? Well, here's the answer. No one. No one. This person can't be found. Are you kidding me? Mark chapter 14, verse 29. Peter says to our Lord, even if all of these men fall away, I never will. See, they can't be hired. They can't be recruited. You can't pay them. What price do you put on this kind of an individual? God alone brings them because God alone makes them. We know very little about that, only what the Scriptures tell us. He makes them in out-of-the-way places. Elijah in Tishbe. It is uh, Paul in Asia. It's Moses in the Midian desert. Here's what we do know for sure. They've walked, and they've fallen. They've tried, and they've failed. They've wept, seeing perhaps for the first time themselves as they really are. For the hypocrites that they truly are tested by all kinds of fires over and over till they become resolute, hard as steel in their souls. So tradition says when they grabbed Peter and they said, we're going to treat you just like we treated him. We're going to crucify you too. And tradition says, Peter said, not like him. Put me upside down. Above, beyond. That's who's faithful. That's who's trustworthy. That's who's performance perfect. That is not the person that comes instantly. See, the world wants instant performance. Do it and do it now. That's not this person. A.T. Pearson, the famous Presbyterian, wrote, in God's current of time, the silt falls from our lives. That's the process. And God brings them. And they come out of nowhere. But here's what my counsel is to you, the wisdom of God from the Scriptures. And when you find them, follow them. When you find them, follow them. Because they'll take you to the Lord. In every case, they'll take you directly to the Lord. And that's where you want to be. Because you see, they 
have His character, just like Him. And here's the way the Apostle describes it for us in Ephesians chapter 3. That same character, quality, faithfulness, trustworthiness, conscientiousness. The Apostle prays, and now unto Him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. That's His person. That's performance perfect. That's Nadia Comaneci at the Olympics on the uneven bars. A 10 for 10. Never been done before. That's this Word. That's this person. Find them. And follow them. They'll take you to the Lord. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time of study this morning. So grateful for the wisdom of Solomon that once again he gives us the insight into the perfect man, the perfect woman. And we are reminded again of the Lord Jesus who taught us hunger and thirst after righteousness. That's the way. And that's the truth. And that's the life that you give. And we thank you in His name and for His glory's sake. Amen.